In 1997, Intel dove into the enterprise networking arena with their Express series of stackable networking equipment. These competitively priced and modular stacks, including Layer 3 switches, competed with the likes of Cisco and 3Com. Gigabit Ethernet was right around the corner in 1998, and of course you could upgrade these Intel units to take advantage of those new speeds. I've got some of these Intel units on the bench today. We'll battle years of dust, hunt down some of the very elusive Intel Device View management software, and maybe even see how they stack up against some Cisco gear. Let's get into it. These Intel units were generously donated by a viewer named Steven, along with some other interesting stuff we'll cover in the future. So Steven, thank you very much. On the top, we've got an Intel Express 220T stackable hub. And on the bottom, the Intel Express 510T switch. This guy here will be our main focus today in this video. They both can be managed, but I think I can manage this one directly over the serial console to get started. And then we can dive into the software and figure out how to manage this one over the network later. Even though we're worried about the switch today, I did want to get them stacked up here to give you an idea of what they might have looked like if they were all racked up together. It sounds like these things have been decommissioned for many years and they've just been sitting in a warehouse. So we're going to try to breathe some new life into them. Like I was saying, I'm hoping I can initially manage it over the serial console and reset it or get to know it a little better. I do like that they hard coded the 9600 baud 8 in 1 right there. So you can't forget that. Nice industrial design. I like the gray look. I love the big prominent Intel logo. It's actually kind of on this embossed piece of the very nice metal case. Funny to see a physical temperature LED. I wonder if these things were prone to getting warm. That's kind of odd to see on a switch. Along the bottom, you can see we've got 24 auto sensing 10 100 bit Ethernet ports. So you can plug something in and they'll go ahead and figure out what speed they should operate at. And then the pieces which separate this from a more commodity switch, modularity. So we've got a couple slots here. Mine happens to have a 100 FX module here. 100 base FX is just fast ethernet over fiber. So pull that out there and you hook it up something like that. Just a different physical layer than 100 base T or 100 base twisted pair. I think formally it's called TX and this is formally called FX. 100 base T of course over cat five, four, six, whatever cables. And you have your twisted pairs in there. Pretty straightforward on the back. Power in, power switch, and a spot to plug in a redundant power supply system. Now I'm the kind of guy that usually just plugs stuff in and see what happens, but I'm a little suspicious of this one as I've been handling it. For one, there is quite a bit of grime just on the case, sitting on the case. That's not too surprising, but as I'm looking around and trying to poke my head in there, you can see that grime is pretty built up on the fan. Then on the other end of the case, there's this cooling vent area and the stuff in there is looking pretty grimy. So I think we're going to open this thing up. It's looking like just three screws on the back. If we're lucky. I was thinking it slid, but it actually just lifts up like that. <laughs> okay. What? the heck who did this to you that is i mean let me let me give you an example that is so grimy <laughs> oh it's like soot wow man why does every piece of equipment i have look like it's been running in an auto shop for 30 years wow that is impressive my hunch was right <laughs> look at this thing incredible usually the fan being dirty like that wouldn't have bothered me but like some of this stuff was like falling out of it and yeah that was really suspicious <laughs> okay the, the good news is it looks like it's just gonna wipe off like I'm, I'm hoping i don't have to i'm doing nothing and it's coming right off so it's really dry it's not like grimy or dingy or anything like someone else was i mean i'm not even mad i'm just impressed let's see if we can get this not with that bit. I was saying, I'm going to need to take this thing completely apart, I think, to clean it. So we'll start. This is, one, this is another one of those things where it's like, I bet if I just turn it on, it'll just work. And now I'm getting in here, I'm messing with it. You know, am I going to make, am I going to break something? But if this thing got warm, oh, it'd be terrible to be around. That's a, this is really nice. It doesn't flop. It's in this like guided rail system. Really good. Yeah, look at that. Uh, pretty grimy. What next? Really friendly design. There's no screws on the back holding anything 
in. It's all just from the top down on the boards and little clips for the power supply to slide out. Speaking of, I think we'll deal with him next. Same screws they used on the case, always nice. This might be an AT power supply. <laughs> yeah, it slides right out. Oh, gotta love that. Woo, man, this is dirty. Grounding screw, just like that. This fan slides out. I bet he's in rough shape. <laughs> Look at all that crap that fell out of the fan. Next up, I think I'm gonna try to take off this module board cage rail thing. It's also on its own riser. And again, doesn't seem too bad. It doesn't smell bad, by the way. Oh, look at that. So, so easy. All right, let's get this riser out of here. Maybe not. She's in there pretty good. I think we'll leave it. We'll pull the main board. Got this ribbon cable for the front LED assembly and buttons pulled out of the way. There's only been two types of screws so far. Some gold ones that are inside the case and the black ones on the outside. So that is a really nice touch. I'm leaving this in, by the way, because as I was pulling it, the board was flexing. So we might just try to take that out when the whole main board's out. What am I missing? I think the back of these screws might be in the way. A third screw type. I shouldn't have said anything. I think I gotta take this front assembly off. Just a few screws around the perimeter. A fourth type of screw. Intel, you're falling apart. And everyone that says I should use gloves, I I don't care. I don't like wearing gloves. It's just some dust. Actually, I don't think that front thing coming off is gonna help me at all. Uh, believe it or not, I think I need to take the switch out though. Hopefully without breaking its little plastic tabs. Come on, little buddy. The nuts that the redundant power supply screws go into are right there, so the board can't just lift right up. So you have to push the board forward into the front and it barely gets past that. And now I'm in this situation where maybe I have to take out this grounding. Nah, that's part of the case. It's just barely not enough clearance. I don't want to flex the board too much. It wasn't pretty, <laughs> but you take this whole front piece off and you can slide the board out just enough to lever it up past all the obstructions in the back and then you angle it and then yeah, here we are. That's what it's supposed to look like. Nice and green, pretty cool looking board actually. It's really big. So let's see if we can just brush this stuff off. It seems pretty loose. The carnage. Look at all that stuff. Truly incredible. The before shot here, it's not grimy at all. In fact, I just ran my hands under some water and it comes right off. It's a really fine, light dust. So here's the dream. I'd rather not run this under the sink today. Oh yeah, look at that. This will be fine. Um, a little dusty though. I'd rather not run this under the sink today because I gotta wait 24 hours. And uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna bust all this off with the paintbrush and then I'll hit it with the air compressor upstairs. I'll bring you back and we'll, we'll see where we're at. Check this out. All I did was hit this with the air compressor. I have not wiped anything down and it came out perfect. Everything looks brand new. That light dust flew right off immediately. Super easy. What I'm going to do is wipe down this case with some Windex. I'm not even going to mess with the board itself. I'll just hit these contacts with contact cleaner and then we'll get it back together. Intel's internal development name might have been Cork, because it's called the Cork Riser Board. And then in the corner of the main board, Cork 24 port 10100T. Well, it isn't perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better. PCBs look great, they look brand new. Let's get the lid on and hook it up, see what it does. You know it's a pro level repair when you button everything up, you got a bunch of screws left over. 
Got the front console port going through a USB to serial converter. Place your bets. Are all those capacitors just gonna blow up? And this was all for nothing. <laughs> that fan is crusty. I don't know why I didn't think about that until just now. <laughs> I should have fixed the bearing in that fan. That's okay. I'm seeing nothing on the console. It's definitely doing its little light dance. Yeah, nothing on the console yet. I'll, I'll give it a few minutes, I guess, just in case. Otherwise, I'll get ready to plug it into a real serial port on another computer, not this USB adapter thing. Got my little adapter party there, a no modem and a gender switcher for the cable. Going into a real serial port on this machine and it's party time. I'm SSH'd here into the machine with the serial port. It prompts you with press a key to enter local management. And then you get into this nice thing. And I don't know the password. So if I press A for administrator, ask me for the password, try admin, illegal password, which is a pretty aggressive way of saying your password's wrong. Uh, I guess we'll try no password, nothing. So we know a little bit of information though. There is a reset procedure. There's a reset switch on the front and we can get this to reset itself and I can set a password, but we also know it's network now, 192.168.889. So let's get a machine hooked up to this, see if we can ping it, and then look at the Windows software that you can use to manage these things. It'd be kind of nice to see the original config before I do a full wipe, it'll lose everything, just at, you know, curiosity's sake. Uh, I'll do it if I have to, but let's take a look. I have what has proven to be a really useful setup down here. So this port goes directly through to the room with the rack into a dedicated network interface on a Dell R720, which is hosting my Proxmox instance. And you can see we've got connectivity, that's good. Proxmox is an open source hypervisor. So basically some software that lets you run VMs on a physical machine, which I highly recommend. I think I've been using it for something like three or four years, incredibly useful. I can set up something called a bridge, a network bridge. It's basically like a virtual switch that that port is connected to. And then I can pass that network interface to a VM of my choice. My choice is Windows XP. So I find Windows XP is a really nice uh, combination between old and new. You can put pretty old browsers on it. It can still run newer stuff. My definition of new is like 2015. So you saw it's got two NICs on it. And one of them is that pass through I was just showing you. And I have configured it to be on the same network, 192.168.88 as my switch over here. And if we ping that switch at dot nine, replies. So we're on the same network. Let's take a look at this software. And you know, I like a good cursed enterprise software experience as much as the next guy. So look at this. Intel device view is the Windows software you could use to manage these Express 500 series of networking equipment. What was going on in the nineties, at least in the United States? Look at this guy. He's like, we got this huge networking cable. He's moving so fast that it couldn't possibly be his gigantic thighs. So he's got like wings on his head, probably some Greek mythology stuff. Like this art style was ev everywhere in tech magazines and everything. Like what? This aesthetic had a stranglehold on the tech community in the late 90s. In my arrogance, I assumed it was going to be super easy to find a copy of this Intel device view for Windows and web. This is kind of what it looked like. So it's a Windows app that lets you visualize the servers if you're on the same network, I think. And I can't find this thing anywhere. It does not appear to be on the internet archive. At least I can't find it. There's a one-year-old Reddit post, someone in my same situation. They've uh, picked up one of these networking switches and the thread has been archived. No comments. The usual first port of call after a quick Google doesn't work is you go to the internet archive and you go to the actual provider's website, so Intel in this case, they've got network IDV here, and there's a scrape from 1999 for Intel device view, and you think you're there, you can taste it, Intel device view for Windows, click that, there it is, IDV 210 windows.exe from 1999, you're feeling good? The archive couldn't scrape it because it was some friggin' ASP dynamic download backend. <laughs> that Intel had, so it wasn't scrapable back then. So that's a no-go. You do more Googling, of course, and you find forum posts from 2009, and someone says, yeah, go to intel-driver.com. It's right there. That site's no longer available because it was probably full of viruses, but you find Intel device view 2117. That looks pretty good. 
the archive has it. This sketchy download now thing could not be archived. Also, some sort of ASP dynamic backend. So if anyone has intel-driver.com's ID equals 114 download, let me know. And then a variation of the 2009 post you saw earlier. Someone uh, in 2011 is being condescending and saying, have you considered Googling that exe name? And we get this FTP link. This domain name resolves to an IP. Time's out. Doesn't work. So you get real desperate. You're on a Russian forum post from 2021. It, if this says anything offensive, I'm sorry. I don't speak Russian. But basically this guy's asking, hey, I have this 530T switch. I need Intel device view. I think maybe like an automated bot or, or something responded with that same FTP link. So this was in 2021. Presumably I'm just like three years late. Doesn't work. It was on Intel's website. It's not, it's not paid software. Like you could just go download it back in the day and they shipped it on a CD with every single one of these uh, devices. We've got it. Version 2117. I also reorganized my desktop. Otherwise you were gonna see some hints about future video ideas I've got. I asked for help in the serial port channel discord. I had been searching for this thing for hours and within seconds, I've got a bunch of responses. Special shout out to ZZYZX and Mark. They both found links right away. And ultimately, a buddy of Mark's was able to help us download this couple versions of it, actually. I haven't gotten past this screen. It's looking pretty legit. I don't actually know if it's going to run on XP. This stuff back in the day was made for Windows 98. These things came out in 97. So let's see what happens. Oh, yeah. This is what I want to see. Look at those ones and zeros flowing. It's funny when you install this older uh, Windows software on a OS that's even just slightly newer. I mean, this XP version is probably from 03 or something. And this, this is probably a 98 or, well, Windows 2000 version. And yeah, it's just going to hang here at 100% for a while. Probably going to work. This is probably what it was jammed up on. Setup has detected that Internet Explorer 4.0 or later is not installed. It will run, but some features won't be present. Yes, let's do it. We might have to whip out the... The Windows 98 VM. I am very excited about this. Look at this. It, so it's going to go off and look for these express switches, the 500 series switches. It's asking local network only, which I think is what I want. We are on the local network with the switch. We're on the entire network and it's warning about we might open WAN connections. <laughs> we'll, st we'll stick with local. Okay, right away. Old device wizard. It's telling me just to connect my device up. I just powered it back up. It had been off. We'll see if it finds it. I wonder if this program is smart enough to know that we're on two networks. I would imagine that that is um, Windows responsibility to route traffic to the right network interface, but we'll see. Just to double check, I can see the switch. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll be factory resetting that thing after all. This thing can't find it. Let's exit the wizard. Oh, here we go. Manage. I can enter a IP address. Let's see if we can find it. <laughs> it found it. Yes, it found it. So I could. I went to device manage, entered the IP address of that thing, and here it is. This is incredible. And I am seeing some information I will not be able to show you guys. This thing came from Rhode Island. I guess I'll say that. Guilford IDF. C prod control. So the next morning, got my coffee. Check out this sweet mug my wife got me for Christmas. Been poking around at this router and learned a few things. First up, we can telnet into it from a computer on the same network, and we are presented with that same menu that the serial console management port gave us, which is pretty nice. This is pretty typical for gear like this to be able to telnet in as well, so that's pretty nice that Intel had that. And I don't know the administrator password, but you can go over to the user menu and it allows monitoring but maybe you can't actually configure anything and it doesn't have a password set for some reason so we can get in and kind of take a look at what the switch is up to so if we go to configuration so it knows i'm a user so i can't actually get in and reset anything so i can't use any of these menu items all i can do is quit and go back but we can go down to monitoring and we can sort of take a look at some stuff so we can get general stats on what the switch is up to which is pretty cool 
let's take a look at port info. So you can go look at every single individual port. Let's take a look at system overview. Looks like it's running a version of the firmware from the year 2000. So it had been updated since it was built. I think this was built in 97 or 98. Got a megabyte of RAM and two megabytes of flash memory. Back in the Intel device view UI, you can click aspects of the switch to find out information about it, including the switch itself. So you can double click. As far as I can tell, there's just a little bit of configuration that's kind of been left. The location and contact information of presumably the last IT administrator. I think I actually found him on LinkedIn. He's retired, <laughs> was an IT guy based on the, the location. <laughs> kind of funny. It's had an IP set, this 88 network with a 255-255-248 subnet mask. And it had a 192.168.16.1 default gateway set. And then one last piece of information. A description on port one says two Intel 220. So that must be the hub I got with this switch, the 220T. They must have been operating in the same environment. So that's got me inspired. Let's clean that hub up, see if it works, hook it up in this original configuration and see if this Intel device view thing will just start managing it. Also, if you're curious how this application is talking to this thing, they are really chatty over SNMP. You can see in Wireshark here, constant communication back and forth between each other. The hub appears to be suffering from the same dust affliction as the switch. So yeah, they were definitely running in the same environment. Let's get the lid off. Same chassis size and screw setup, just three on the back. But we've got these cable connectors here so that you could stack these units three at a time. The switches have special modules you can buy that have uh, cables you can plug in and let you stack those things seven high or something like that. I think we're going to see the same story in here based on the dust that's fallen out. Oh yeah. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Look at this. I suspect it's the same type of really light dust. Yeah, that's great. So I'm not even going to take this thing apart. I'm going to take it upstairs, hit it with the air compressor. Because that worked so well last time, I don't even think I need to bother taking the mainboard out. All the dust will come out. I'll hit it with the lid off, and this time I'll film it. Can't complain about that. Hit the case with Windex. It's just as clean as anything else I own. Intel must have been at a competitive advantage, at least in terms of what they could charge for these things, given that they were one of, if not the biggest chip fabs at the time when these were being produced. Each one of these here, some sort of IO controller or something for each of the ports is an Intel chip. The hub doesn't have any sort of dedicated management interfaces aside from all the ethernet ports on the front, but it does have this managed LED. So I'm hoping we'll be able to interact with it in that Intel device view software. Let's see what happens. Ooh, look at that. It's happy right away. Excellent. This guy is fully operational when all these turn off, I think. Fan on this one, no trouble at all. And this one gets better and better the longer I run the thing. Let's hook up port one, just for fun. No connectivity. Ah, maybe it's not configured at all. Uh, port one's enabled for sure. So there's something going on with the hub. Let's take it out of bridge mode. See if that makes a difference. Well, how do we interact with it? All right, reading the manual. I need a crossover cable to connect this thing up to a hub. So we'll have to make one but I can use this straight through to go right to a machine. So we'll experiment with the Lenovo real quick. Don't know why I unplugged that one. Yeah, there you go. Working fine, I just don't have the right cable. I'm going to make a tiny little crossover cable real quick. It has a slightly different pinout than a regular straight through cable. You know, a couple of the wires are crossing over as you might expect from the name. So I'll be right back. Crossover cable finished and installed, appears to be working. We have connectivity between the switch and the hub now. I was looking at the manual and you might need like a special management module in another one of the hubs that has the modular components, but we'll try this little wizard. I don't know though. Yeah, I did some more reading and 
Some of these with less ports have module bays, just like the Switch does. And one of them is a management module you can slide in, and only then can you manage them with the Intel device view. So that's a bummer, but this hub is working great. So I did something kind of funny here. I've got it going into the network rather than the Switch now. And then all the traffic is flowing through our crossover cable to the Switch. And of course, I can Telnet in and interact with the Switch, no problem. So fully functional hub. So we're gonna say goodbye to the hub for now. We don't need it anymore. And what we're gonna do is try to get this 510T switch into something called maintenance mode. So you do that by holding in the reset button and then over the serial console, we should be able to reset all the default parameters and get a new admin password. All the instruction manuals say that you're supposed to hold in this reset button for five seconds and a system LED is gonna start rapidly flashing. I don't have a system LED even though I do have a 510T switch and I was looking at the 510T documentation. <laughs> so we'll get in here and try it for a few seconds. Status changed right away. Yeah, okay. It's a typo in the manual. Status is what you want. That's blinking. Now let's go look at the serial console. Good news, we are at a maintenance prompt now instead of that UI from before. You can do things like boot the router off of TFTP and get new firmware on it and do like memory diagnostics, things like that but we want to do something called run def arm, which is default parameters, I get maybe. <laughs> if we run this, it should factory reset the router. Okay, it's doing its thing, I think. We've got something called launcher version 2.10 from 1998. All the lights on the front are going to town. I think that's it. So there should be no admin password, I'm, I'm guessing. There is not. We are reset. This is great. And now the default network is 192021. So that must be what it ships with. Let's go forget the other one. I think it, oh, look at that. It found it, the little wizard. Oh, and it's, and it's asking me to put it on the 8.8 network. That's interesting. Let's just give it the same IP as before. So I don't forget. This is really interesting. Wow. That was pretty slick. Let's go to configure device. It's the 510T switch. Make this PC the only manager. No. Yeah, look at that. We're back in business, except this time we're an admin. One thing that's been bugging me is it doesn't see the 100FX module. So I'm gonna turn off the router, reseat it, clean the connectors again, see if that makes a difference. Otherwise, maybe there's an install procedure. I don't know. They look pretty clean. I mean, they were protected from all that dust inside the connector. Yeah, they're totally clean. So we'll reseat it, I guess, and uh, see where that gets us. These are not hot swappable, by the way. System needs to be entirely powered off to do this. I read the manual. I don't see anything about needing to do anything on the software side. It should just work. A reseat would be a nice repair, but <laughs> I have my doubts. This is what it's like when the switch is off and disconnected. It shows this little disconnected icon in the UI. Pretty nice. Nothing. Let's put it in slot B just to see. Who knows? It'd be kind of a bummer if the one module I have doesn't work. <laughs> They're not exactly plentiful on eBay. That was a pretty tight fit. I bet that slot has never been used keep up appearances here. Eh, no light. I don't think so. Interesting. Well, well, I guess. Feeling pretty stupid about buying a 100FX port adapter for my Cisco 7200 gear to connect this up to. We'll have to figure that out later. Let's play around with this thing just a little bit more to see what it's like to use it in an InfoWorld article from February 23rd, 1998, reviewing this switch. They mostly gave it glowing reviews, but one of the cons they listed was could not modify multiple port settings simultaneously, at least with the current software. So well, let's do that. Let's create a VLAN. Uh, I, don't, I haven't looked up how to do any of this. You have this device view where you see the device. Then there's this explorer view where you can look at all the ports at once. It's kind of nice. It's just got the system VLAN. I can't multi-select the switches. You really are just editing one port at a time, I think. Let's try to make a, a test VLAN. Side note, a VLAN is basically a way to take one physical switch and divide it into multiple virtual switches. 
So I can assign the first eight ports to one network, the next eight ports to another. I can have them completely segregated or I can allow cross traffic between them. Basically a way to divide this one hardware switch into multiple configurable little switches. So it should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, let's do switch port VLAN. Okay, let's call it test VLAN. I can assign the first five ports to the VLAN at once. That's nice. We have a VLAN with five ports. Now, okay, when it comes to VLANs, I think you could argue this is multi-port management, but I can't like get in here and edit, you know, a bunch of ports at once and just disable them. Or if you look at one port mode, I can't just uh, disable auto negotiation, for example, on all of them for, for whatever reason. Well, I don't know why I'd want to do that, but so yeah, kind of agree with the article. You can't log in twice either. So here I am trying to telnet into the remote management. And if I go administrator, it says the monitor is busy. Press any key. I'm pretty sure that's because this thing is connected. Let's get out of here. Actually, it's because I'm connected over here. So <laughs> let's log out of this terminal. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm in. You can go into configuration, but what I was getting at here is I don't know how to actually like change the VLAN settings in here. I think you might have to do it from that UI, which is horrifying. Let's have a little VLAN creation shootout with some contemporary gear our friends over at Cisco were slanging back at the same time period. The Catalyst 2900 Series XL gear came out in 1998. This specifically is a 2924C. This would have set you back 4,995 US dollars in 1998. And by comparison, you'd be paying $4,775 for this Intel 510T. So a little bit cheaper. Plus you get the modularity. Some of these bigger 2900 series XL machines also have modular spots, but this one doesn't. And it's more expensive than this one. A big thing back then was price per port. I don't know if it still is today, but this one clocks in around 199, this one around 208 US dollars. So I didn't look up the throughput stats or anything like that, but I think Intel gets a point for price because you can upgrade this thing to do gigabit ethernet. Console port on the back for the Cisco. And I will be running it through a USB to serial converter because it always works. Point for Cisco in that department. Let's power this up. It's louder. As it's booting up, it sort of counts down as it turns off each port light from left to right. It is reporting hardware failure on six of its ports. Another point for Intel, I guess. Ah, but does Intel lose points because its modules aren't as reliable? I'm just making up that point stuff, by the way. I'm not actually keeping track. Here we are in the serial console of the Switch. It's running a version of iOS from 2007. Pretty impressive. I don't actually know how to configure a Cisco Switch. I've never done it. So I'm gonna go watch some YouTube videos. I'm back, I'm an expert now. So this switch is running what seems to be a pretty old version of iOS 12.0. And as I'm going through this, you'll see I'm doing things in maybe a way that's different than what you're used to on more modern or different iOS versions. And we're missing some quality of life, important quality of life improvements for our shootout here, as you'll see. So this will be pretty interesting from a historical iOS perspective. So let's enable First thing, we're going to see what the VLAN situation is. We have a default VLAN with all the ports assigned. So that's great. Next thing we do is we go VLAN database to go in here and create one, add a VLAN to the switches database. All VLANs have a unique numerical identifier. So I'm going to make a VLAN 10 and you can see VLAN 10 added to the database right there. I can give it a name, VLAN 10 name test. And if we get out of here, we say show VLAN again. We now have a test VLAN with no interfaces assigned. This is where it gets weird. At this point, you would usually comp T and configure a range of interfaces. So these are all my interface names up here. Usually you would use the interface range command, but as you'll see, this version of iOS doesn't have an interface range. Pretty interesting. For example, on a 7204 VXR I've got running in the other room. It's running iOS 12.3. Now it announces itself as 7200 software. The other router announces itself as 2900 XL software. I don't know if there's like differences there or if this really was implemented after version 12.0. That machine has a card in it in slot zero. It's got two interfaces on it. 
0, and 1. So if we take a look, we've got fast ethernet 0, 0, and fast ethernet 0, 1. Those correspond to that front card. What you would normally do is just configure terminal, use the range command to configure fast ethernet card 0, ports 0 through 1. And now, with the same commands, I am configuring a range of the ports. But obviously, we don't have that luxury on the 2900 over there for some reason. So what you'd have to do is come in here and, I guess, configure each interface manually. Can't type today. We switch port mode access, switch port access VLAN 10, bring her up. Now if we go back to show VLAN, we can see port 1 has been assigned to our test VLAN. And I guess on this version of iOS, you would have to do that one by one. That's kind of weird. Um, Intel wins today. Well, I don't know if that was an entirely fair shootout with the version of iOS I've caught on here, but someone at some point was out there using that and it would have been pretty painful to configure VLANs unless the multi-port configuration setting is hiding somewhere I don't know how to find. But to summarize, between the two, I think the Intel stuff feels, this is anecdotal, just a little less professional, a little less polished. I mean, they weren't in the game as long. Cisco had been making networking equipment well over a decade by the time this came out, but it was easy to use. I rarely had to consult the documentation. When I did, it was very well written, right to the point. I was able to find out what I needed to do, you know, to reset it, for example, or why this couldn't be managed without the module. Super straightforward. A lot of thought went into the ecosystem. They kept the design language the same. They created the module version for this one so that they could all be managed together by an IT administrator. Overall, pretty interesting, I would say. I'm a huge fan of Andy Grove. He was the third employee at Intel, basically. Robert Noyce and Moore, Moore, of course, being the originator of Moore's Law, get a lot of credit as co-founders of Intel. But I think Andy Grove was sort of the driving force and energy that turned Intel into what it is today. And in his 1997 book, which is right when this 510T came out. He actually goes over his thoughts about what the internet means for Intel. So I'm gonna explore these in another video. Maybe we'll try to build a different network. I'll try to pick up some more of this gear. I think it's pretty interesting. I'll try to distill my thoughts about where these lie in Intel's history and its whole positioning on network in general. So that'll be in a future video. But I hope you enjoyed this journey. I truly did have a lot of fun playing with these. They're really cool. And let me know if you like this like half ass shootout thing I did. I think it might be interesting in the future to do comparisons on Cisco versus the rest of the networking world. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. And if you'd really like to support the channel and help me justify the Intel stuff I'm about to buy after I turn the camera off, you can check me out on Patreon. I do behind the scenes type videos, early access, and you just get a general idea of what I'm up to and what I'm tinkering with. I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.